Hey everyone, um, welcome to the Hasura community call. This is the end of the year Hasura community call. And um, the Hasura community call is um, a monthly community call where our engineers share product updates, discuss upcoming features, present RFCs and cool demos and answer your questions. We also have a short presentation by a community member or two, uh, which by the way, this month we have two, um, who showcase what they've built for the Hasura community. So thank you so much for joining us for the Hasura community call and we are super excited to have all of you. Um, as usual, I'm Vish, I am your host. And here is the agenda for this month. Tanmay will be kickstarting the community call with a Hasura update. Shahid will tell us about connecting um, to private or on-prem databases. Um, Shraddha and Suraj are presenting their first community call demos. So yay for that. Shraddha will be presenting Datadog integration, which is now in preview. Suraj will be demoing the remote, remote schema permissions. I will give a quick community update on all of our upcoming events and what's in store um, next. And um, we have two community call demos. This month, um, Josh Curl from High Touch will be presenting on High Touch Sync SQL to Sales and Marketing Tools. And Raj Singh from Novum will be presenting on Managing Computational Chaos with Hasra and State Machines. So thank you so much. I think we are good to kickstart the call. Um, Tanmay, over to you. Uh, hey, 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 everybody. Uh, all right, so uh, end of the year call. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, stuff that we have in store for 2021 um, and things that we've been working on. Uh, so let me, let me share my screen, all right. All right, can you folks see? Yep. Cool, awesome. So uh, let me get my pointer on. So the first thing that we've been hard at work on is multiple roles and role inheritance um, and kind of specking out how that would work. It's a slightly complex feature um, uh, because uh, Hasra supports a bunch of different data sources, upstream data sources, and there are lots of peculiar scenarios that can arise when we're thinking about kind of combining roles and role inheritance, right? Um, and uh, what, what we're working on will now kind of allow people to easily create roles and think of them as policies and then reuse those policies to create kind of more complex roles uh, that inherit from those policies and inherit from other roles, right? Um, a very simple example would be, you know, you have um, a role uh, called public, which has access to all of the users and only their names right? Only that column or that field. And then you have a role called private, which has access to, you know, my own information. So there's, you know, user ID, profile.id equal to access or user ID. And I also have access to ID, name, email, and all of that, right? Um, what today, you can use public or private. And so at the time of query, you have to specify which role you're running as, right? Um, and so now what you can do is you can create a role called, you know, public plus private. And what that will do is automatically compose the introspection schema so that when you query as public plus private, you'll automatically get the right kind of introspection result. Um, and if you actually run the query on users, you'll kind of automatically get just the user information from, um, for, for all of the users that are not you. And for the user that is you, you'll get all of your information in one place, right? Um, and so this will dramatically kind of simplify the way, you know, you, you manage roles in kind of fairly complex scenarios and also use them at query time. Um, we're looking at doing a preview in December and then releasing this by GraphQL Asia, which would be sometime in February. Um, and that should be uh, that should be super exciting. So as soon as we have the preview, we'll drop uh, everyone a note on Twitter and Discord and stuff like that. And so do try it out. This will initially support Postgres reads. We'll gradually move to Postgres writes. We'll gradually then add remote schemas and actions as well. Um, so that's, that's the rough plan to move towards a full release by February. The next thing I want to talk about is um, oh, also I just wanted to add realize thank you animation is that we'll also we're also working on a generic role level security engine um, that can kind of help us combine uh, sources across other databases and sources as well. So we're kind of whatever work that we're doing today, we're just bringing that uh, upper level, making that a little more formal so that then we can kind of compose from you know multiple data sources as well, and we can provide similar authorization features 
on other kinds of data sources that are not as powerful as Postgres as well. Um, the uh, the other API, which is uh, the other uh, uh, thing that we're working on that is uh, going to be an early release, uh, is uh, something a little bit controversial, <laughs> which is, uh, well, controversial not because of the feature itself and the value, but controversial because, well, you know, with, with GraphQL people, uh, is REST APIs with GraphQL query templates. And so one of the things that we've often heard uh, with, with uh, you know, people kind of starting to use GraphQL, especially in, you know, mm, mm, in environments that are not just modern front-end web apps, right? But if you think about maybe mobile applications or other services or other developers using the API or, or in enterprise environments, right? Um, REST APIs are very easy because there's a tremendous amount of tooling that we already have available, right? So there's API monitoring and gateways and CDNs to caching stuff, right? There's cache control headers. There's, there's a lot of stuff and tooling that's built around it, which pretty much has to get entirely reinvented. And so what we're planning to do is add um, support for being able to kind of go to graphical, create a GraphQL query, uh, and then template out certain things by you know creating GraphQL query variables, and then creating an idiomatic REST endpoint, right? Whether it's a get or post or put or patch or delete. So controlling kind of you know the, uh, the 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 way that you'll get error responses, the way that you'll get kind of cache control headers, the way that you'll see um, you know the URL path parameter and stuff like that. It'll make a lot of that easy. Um, so that uh, so that you can continue to use you know, kind of your REST tooling and stuff like that. Um, so that is um, that's that's our um, that's that's kind of something that we'll be doing an early preview of, and then we'll also be experimenting with gRPC support on this. And this will drastically help people who are also looking at kind of you know, one of the other problems also also with uh, with with GraphQL that we've seen is that you know it. It's, it, it does seem like for a lot of people, there's gonna be a combination of REST and GraphQL, right? So using GraphQL as an intermediate representation to be able to create REST and gRPC endpoints and, and in the future, maybe other things as well, is gonna make it very easy for people to say, you know, it's 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 a de-risk approach to kind of starting to use GraphQL. It's um, it's also a place where other other consumers who are not just web clients for whom other style of other styles of consuming APIs is better than uh, GraphQL. Uh, you know they they'll kind of get on board and be able to use um, use the, the the power of those APIs as well. So that was number two. Uh, number three, CI/CD improvements across the board. Um, CI/CD um, is starting to become fairly complicated. It can be done in many many different ways. We're working on creating kind of a primary recommended flow, and this is more of a guide rather than actually. Uh, feature. Um, so obviously anything that you do is not going to go away, but we'll, we can start unifying things into a primary recommended flow that will uh, make um, a little bit of the CI CD uh, stuff uh, better across local and remote environments, right? Where the, wherever you're running Hustler. Um, and specifically, especially with the metadata separation release, uh, um, easier uh, high availability rollouts right now, high availability rollouts are a little bit um, uh, are, are, are a little bit challenging to configure, right? It, it requires some amount of work. So uh, that will become drastically easier um, as, as we think about this as well. And then, you know, having a nice GitHub integration so that you can just do Git push to deploy um, from, a, from a branch, from your main branch, from release branch, or even from PRs um, with, with the GitHub action and stuff like that will become easy once that primary recommended flow and that HA rollout uh, is there. So, so a bunch of recipes here mostly um, and some tooling around kind of, you know, GitHub work that we've been doing that there's already a ton of great stuff in the community, um, uh, but kind of helping unify that a little bit is going to be very helpful. So that is something that we're working on as well. All right, so this is all of the stuff that I talked to you about is scheduled for early next year. So that's, you know, around, um, um, in 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 the first quarter, right? So in January, February, March. Um, after Q1, um, there's there's a bunch of stuff that we're working on, but uh, stuff that I would like to two 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 quick things that I like to talk about is first, support for at live deference stream. Um, so support for these directives, which is going to be very useful for uh, people fetching larger amounts of data, uh, and data from sources where not all sources uh, are. Uh, have the same kinds of latencies, right? One of the problems uh, that we've seen with uh, subscriptions and especially kind of Hustler's live query style subscriptions is that oftentimes you want to subscribe to a live payload, but you know, you, you want to keep, you want to subscribe actually to only one of those fields in the payload. So you do want the latest result, um, but, but you don't want to, uh, you don't want to kind of get that whole uh, payload changing payload, you only just want a particular field, the rest of it can be cached, for example, right? So you cache the main payload and you keep one of the fields live um, and so, so adding capabilities like that, which will, you know, dramatically uh, reduce the load 
um, and and also kind of increase um, increase the amount of confidence and performance that you get for for those queries, uh, and give more control to the client to choose how they want to consume this information. Um, we're also going to be extending our multiple role composition, what I talked about earlier, um, to other databases and other API sources. Um, and then we're kind of laying the foundation for that work in the first three months so that we can then start working across other databases. Uh, and not not just, you know, initially we'll start off with Postgres and remote schemas um, and actions. And then, you know, later on we'll kind of uh, start moving this to, to other data sources as well, the, the authorization system. Um, so those are the big things that we're working on. There's a tremendous amount of uh, other stuff as well in the pipeline. Um, and most of them you can track on GitHub uh, with, uh, which, are, which are kind of like, you know, smaller feature additions and stuff, but these are the big fundamental uh, changes that uh, or, or additions uh, that are that are that are happening at Hasura. But that's the update from my end. Um, back to you, Vish. Uh, any any questions? Please do feel free to uh, reach out to me on Twitter, Discord, or chat here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tanmay. That was an amazing update from your end. Um, moving forward, we have Shahid to tell us something about connecting to private or on-prem databases. Shahid, are you here? Okay, um, I don't see Shahid has joined. So while Shahid joins us for his demo, maybe we can move on to Shraddha's demo, which is on Datadog in integration that's now in preview. Shraddha, are you ready? Hey, thanks, Fish. I'll just quickly share my screen. Sure. Sorry for putting you on spot, by the way. <laughs> Not at all. Go for okay. it. Can you folks see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so hey folks, I'm Shraddha and I will be demoing the Datadog integration today. Datadog integration basically allows you to export all your operation logs for any particular project to your Datadog dashboard. So to configure it, let's uh, go to the project setting page and I'll go to the integration tab here. In the Datadog, I can just click configure. And here, so Datadog has two regions, US and EU. We support both of them. So depending on your API's region, you can choose either US or EU. And for the API, um, for the API, we have a handy link where which uh, navigates to the Datadog setting page from which you can get uh, the API key. Uh, once that is configured, we also have options to configure the host service name and tags, which basically allows you to filter out the logs on your Datadog dashboard. And once all of that is done, uh, you're good to go. I have, it takes a little while for this integration to pick up. So I have another project with it already set up. So I'll just go here. And as you can see, we have the host and service and tags as uh, it was configured. And last log basically signifies when was the last log uh, successfully exported by us to your data log dashboard. Um, so this is basically the timestamp last when it was done. Uh, let's go to the console now and make a couple of queries to test this. So I'll just make some queries here. Just to give you an overview, I have a very simple test table here mm, with a single uh, auto increment int field, which I just queried. Now this should do two things. One is that it should update the last log. So let's just refresh this. And it can, it shows me the timestamp as 9.49 PM, which is uh, the current time for me. And the second thing it should do is that essentially the logs should be exported. So, so from, uh, I, I can see that the logs were exported. And as you can see, uh, this configured on our dashboard. Those are configured here. We also attach a Hasura Cloud metric source to every single log that exports Hasura. So that is just easier for you to filter out these logs. And yeah. That was basically it. Uh, we also have a pretty detailed um, docs page for this uh, if you want to know more. But yeah, that was it. Over to you, Vish. 
Thank you so much, Shraddha. That was an amazing demo. By the way, um, this was Shraddha's first community call. So um, a huge shout out for her. Um, a huge shout out to Shraddha for such an amazing demo. If you have any questions for her, please leave that in the chat. She'll be hanging out um, during the entirety of the community call. Uh, moving on, we have Suraj with us to present on remote schema permissions. Suraj, are you ready? Okay. Um, Oops, let me just check. I think something's gone wrong with the Zoom link. Just a second. Sure. So sorry about the delay, folks. Just a moment. There's a bit of a calendar boo boo. So uh, he's, I think he just, he just pinged me and said he's uh, joining in a bit. Not a problem. Um, I think we do have Josh with us. So if Josh is ready, I think we can go ahead. That sounds yep, awesome. I'm ready. I can jump in now. Okay, awesome. Right. Let me share my screen. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Can everybody see the slides? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, great to be here. Great to be chatting about Hisora. Um, I'm Josh Curl. I'm co founder and CTO at HighTouch.io. Uh, we're an early stage startup based in San Francisco. We've been using Hisora for about six to seven months now. And I'd say like we've been like pretty happy users of Hisora in that time. So I'm pretty happy to be chatting about like how we've used it, um, what our experience has been, like what we, like what are the different ways that we use it and things like that. Um, if anybody has questions after this and want to get like more background, like how we use Hisora or just any general questions, you can reach out to me at joshwget on Twitter or just email me at josh at hightouch.io. Um, so yeah, basically a little background about me. I've been working in um, backend engineering, infrastructure engineering for a while. I've worked with a lot of developer tools. I used to work at Rancher Labs, which is also in the developer tool space. Um, big advocate of Fisora now and just generally like um, a big fan of the like what different ways it'd be used and like save us time. Um, so a little about high touch. Um, basically what we do is we help sync data from warehouses and we help get that data into sales and marketing tools. And so what's cool about high touch is you can just write SQL to pull data from your data warehouse. It gets the data into the tools that you need without actually having to use data engineers to write pipelines. So it's a big it's a big task for like a lot of companies to spend entering resources to develop these pipelines. But basically, every company needs this data in their sales and marketing tools. Uh, and so we're basically trying to help you like manage that pipeline, make it so you don't have to waste engineering resources doing that. Um, so we got to start with Sora back in April. We were actually working with an engineering contractor who was one of our friends at the time. And he had used Hisora at a previous company. I think it was um, maybe like, like a year prior to that. Uh, and so at first we were like a little bit skeptical. Uh, we were just writing like manual APIs against Postgres and like that's what we were used to. A lot of us had come from Segment and so like that's kind of how we did things there too. And I think we we all had like an like initial skepticism about like the idea of like putting like a wrapper in front of the database just because we had never really seen anything like it before. And so we were definitely a little bit skeptical to start, but I think like over time, like I can't imagine going back to the old way anymore. Um, so we, we were definitely very happy that the contractor kind of like convinced us this was the way to go. I think we were just kind of like interested in trying new tech. So um, I'm glad that we tried it. Definitely like the right move in retrospect. Um, you know, our, our architecture is pretty standard. There's probably like no surprises here for an early stage startup, but all our front end is written in React and TypeScript. Um, Back is written in Node. Postgres is our primary data store. All of our infrastructure is running on AWS. We run the self-hosted open source version of Hisora running in Docker on AWS. Um, and basically our whole control plane is managed by Hisura. Um, so I think like the, the number or like the first benefit that Hisura brings to us is just this really nice admin portal. So there's a lot of tools that exist on top of Postgres for doing like CRUD operations on your database. Those are all great. I think Hisura's UI is actually really intuitive. Um, I'm 
helping out customers with, with the product all day. And like, I'm always in this UI. I think it's been like really nice to have that there. But I think that's what's really cool about it is it's more than just CRUD operations for Postgres. It's also an API layer too. So like the historic UI is a place where I can go to run API commands. So it's both an admin portal for our database and for our APIs. So I kind of think about it as like being like a, like a postman for us. So we don't have to have like another API client for our backend. Uh, and then obviously like the biggest benefit for Sora is really just saving backend engineering time. Um, looking back at how we wrote APIs before Hasura, it really feels like a hack. Um, it takes a lot of time for an engineer to write these pretty standard and menial CRUD APIs. It's pretty bug prone because a lot of it is just copy and pasting code. And so inevitably like you'll forget to like change something in the copy and pasted code and like that's gonna lead to bugs. Um, it means like your front end engineers like to access data in new ways. They have to make requests to backend engineers. And then it was, like a, it was like a coordination process where you have to think about like, how do we want to plan this API? How does the front end plan to use this API? Like how might this resource be accessed in the future? And that kind of coordination, like inevitably just is just spinning wheels that really don't need to be sp uh, spent. Um, so I kind of quantify this as about like two hours per engineer per week. And our engineering team is pretty small right now. It's like three or four people and then some contractors. So. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot of paper for us as a small company, but since our team is so small, we really have very limited resources. And like the, having those two hours back is really just extremely valuable. And that's kind of like amortized like over the year. Like there have been weeks where we've done like a lot more resource creation. And I think like those are the weeks where like, it's just really nice to go into Hasura and just spin up new resources, add permissioning, and it just makes it so much easier. So this is a snippet of code from a previous company that I had worked at. Uh, it, these are just like basically like copy and pasted endpoint handlers that we had written uh, in Go. And you can tell like they're all just like slightly off. Like the connection has a put request, the Apple uh, application has a patch request. And it was just a constant debate, like whether we should just make everything patch because event eventually you're gonna wanna update only one resource. Um, and I think just like, even like little things like this, they just end up taking up like an hour a week just like planning these things. And so like, it's just really a waste. Um, and so just having like the flexibility to have an API that like lets you do like, but lets the front end engineers do basically whatever they want. It's just so valuable. Um, so yeah, going back to like the front end autonomy point, like it's a bit more than just saving back an engineering time. I think it also just allows front end engineers to work more autonomously. So they don't have to like ping engineers and like when I wait on another team, it allows them to kind of like self-service the control plane of like whatever project that they're working on. And so like we actually have all of our front end engineers, they know Hasura very well. I think that's like the extent that they dip into the back end engineering, but they're able to create tables, modify permissions, um, modify existing tables, things like that. They're able to do all those things without actually having to ask permission from a back end engineer. And so when a front end engineer is working on a new project, they can actually just like smoothly go through all these things without having to like coordinate and plan out any of these APIs. And so that's really valuable just in terms of like our front end engineers getting more work done. Um, last thing that I think is just great about Hasura too is just the fact that it's tightly integrated with Postgres. I know Hasura supports a lot more data stores these days, but um, we started out with, with Postgres. Um, that's the database that we've used the most with previous experience in Segment and other places. So having the underlying data database just being exposed is, is really, really handy. Um, we also use like a lot of views within our product too. And so being able to add a table that's actually a view under the hood and still manage it via Hasura and still like permissioning on top of it is really, really nice. Um, I also think like the, the migrations too, like we end up doing a lot of SQL migrations rather than just like the UI based uh, sort of migration. So I like that, like a lot of like the raw under the hood stuff about Postgres is still exposed to the user. Uh, and so it doesn't feel like a higher level. It, it doesn't feel too high level where it just obscures what's going on under the hood. It's like just sit to that sweet spot of abstraction on top of Postgres. Uh, and so I think like what's the future of Hasura at high touch? Like, I'm excited because I think the time savings that we have today are going to scale linearly with the number of engineers that we have. Like right now we have about 50 tables. And I imagine that at the rate that we're creating tables today, like we might have about like 200 that are managed by Hasura at the end of the year. And so that's just like a lot of complexity and to have a single system managing all of that is actually really, really nice. Uh, and not having to manage API endpoints for all of those resources is just really, really valuable. And so I think like even like year after year, like those, those benefits will just scale linearly. Um, we also have a lot of like upcoming use cases where Hasura events will be handy. So particularly like whenever a user edits something in our UI, being able to configure things in their destination um, via Hasura events, it, it's pretty nice. Uh, but I think we'll have like a lot more usage of that in the future. 
Uh, and I think what's what's great too is like when we onboard new engineers, like their first entry point into our stack is kind of like um, it is Hasura. And so like that's where they go to like play around with the API to figure out like um, what different calls the UI is making. It's where they can like look at the code or look at the, the data under the hood and see like what the structure of it is. Uh, and so like, I, I like it as like an entry point for new engineers too. So I think we'll keep using it in that way. Um, yeah, I think that's basically all I had. Um, happy to dive like more into this if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, by the way. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, if you folks have any questions for Josh, he'll be in the chat. And it would also be great if um, Josh, you could um, drop your socials um, just in case yep. any of our audience wants to get in touch with you. Yeah, definitely will do. Thanks, Vish. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we are um, good to go with the next demo. Suraj, um, are you ready? Suraj will tell us about remote schema permissions. Um, Suraj, whenever you're ready. Hey, Visha, can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Uh, hi, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Suraj. Uh, I am an engineer at Hasuga. I work for uh, console team uh, at Hasuga. So let me share my screen uh, before I start. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Great. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly uh, uh, share a couple of things about uh, remote schema permissions. So remote schema permissions uh, is, uh, so there was a previous presentation on the same topic by T2 uh, on last October uh, community call. And uh, if anyone has uh, not seen, uh, this is a wonderful presentation by T2. He has explained how the things are working uh, under the hood and uh, some, some detailed explanation. So uh, I'm not going to uh, deep dive into that, uh, but I'm going to show you something interesting with the UI. So uh, previous uh, demo, it was having uh, uh, a uh, uh, text input and uh, we were kind of uh, entering the type of the schema, uh, the schema and uh, we were applying them on, uh, onto that. But now we have progressed uh, with adding a permission to remote schema with the, with the user interface and also the user interface will let you to add uh, a preset onto remote schema. So I'll show you uh, one by one. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, locally running Hasura instance. If you if you look at my screen, uh, I hope you can see, you all can see my screen uh, with the Hasura uh, console. Cool. Uh, yeah. So right now I do have a locally running Hasura instance, which is a custom uh, pull at this moment, uh, and I do have a simple table here, but I'm not going to do anything with this. Uh, I also have a remote schema uh, which is coming from Heroku. I do have a local. I do have a deployment in Heroku, and uh, that's what I added here. And if you look at here, uh, without any uh, any role, I'm gonna see. Uh, I, I can see everything because it's uh, it has got admin privileges. And now, the moment when I uh, enable uh, Azure role and with a custom uh, uh, headers, you you are not able to see the remote schema uh, fields, right? And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I can now uh, access permissions on uh, uh, by selecting a particular remote schema. And in this case, I'm going to click on this Heroku remote schema, and I'm going to click on permissions. So now uh, this is a familiar user interface, right? We do have a similar thing in uh, Datadab as well. So similarly, I'm going to create a new call called user. And now you can see all uh, a schema definition in a differently looking uh, user interface. And if you look, we do have query root, mutation root. Uh, so uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add uh, specific fields to, to this particular call. So let's say I don't want to expose uh, user aggregate or maybe user by PK. And I don't want to uh, expose these two. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck these two, and I'm simply going to save this permission. And when I go to GraphQL, and if I expose, uh, if I if I open this, I'm only able to see user. 
So this way, uh, even if the remote schema has multiple fields or multiple uh, arguments or uh, things like that, you can you can have a control on that, and you can uh, hide uh, or show uh, a particular field to a particular form. So at the moment when I remove that, I'm able to see other uh, fields as well. Uh, okay. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm quickly gonna query for this. Yeah, so now I got all the response, right? And now uh, I'm gonna jump into the next part. I'm gonna add presets to remote schema. So the typical use case of uh, having a preset is more like, uh, let's say I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm uh, querying user from a totally different uh, GraphQL endpoint, right? Uh, so I want to limit the user to have uh, arguments in it. So in this case, let's say I don't want to expose all the users to, to the uh, end user. And uh, I want to show only uh, uh, the user uh, with the same uh, user ID, uh, whatever the, the header equal to X has to user ID. Uh, let's see how we can achieve that. So I'm gonna go back to uh, remote schema permissions, again, clicking on remote schemas, going to permissions, clicking on this, expanding this. And what I'm gonna do is I am gonna add a condition here and I'm gonna say uh, user, uh, uh, the argument part, I'm gonna say ID uh, equal to X plus Surya user ID. Yeah, I'm gonna save the same. So now let's go and see, you are not able to see we're uh, closing here, right? So this is like from the schema itself, uh, that particular thing is gone. But if I remove that, I'll be able to see this. This is uh, awesome, right? Uh, and uh, I'll be able to see only the user for that particular uh, access. In this case, uh, two. And if I change it to one, and if I run it, I'm able to see only this thing. And you cannot, you cannot uh, pass any arguments uh, to user uh, other than the uh, the visible ones. Uh, so, so basically, if I go go back to UI, there are a couple of things which you can do. Uh, we can select, uh, check or uncheck fields and we can add presets. But uh, in going future, we're gonna uh, make it a little more accessible in terms of uh, accessibility and uh, convenience. Uh, so this, oops, uh, yeah, how do I move it? Cool. Uh, so this is uh, how it is uh, gonna be in the future. Like uh, we'll get a more uh, accessible interface. You'll be able to open fields and you can see arguments separately. You can see fields and you'll have convenient features like uh, toggle all fields at the same time with a single button click. And you'll have suggestions, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so this is uh, what we are uh, gonna make and uh, this is uh, where we are with the UI uh, at this moment. Uh, cool, uh, I think uh, that's all with my presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you a lot. And uh, this was my first community call presentation with us. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Suraj. That was an amazing demo. And yes, as, as Suraj said, um, this was his first community call. So again, huge shout out to Suraj for um, such an amazing um, presentation. Congratulations. Um, if you have any questions uh, around remote schema permissions, or if you have any questions um, aimed at Suraj specifically, ask them in the chat. He'll be there in the chat. And um, yes. we have our other community presenter, Raj um, from Novum. And um, let's see if Raj is ready to go with his demo on managing computational chaos with Hasra and stake machines. Raj, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. Awesome. How's it going, everyone? Um, let me go ahead and share my screen really quick. Cool. So, hey, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk about managing computational chaos. Um, 
really ominous name. Uh, my name is Raj. I am a co-founder at Novum, as well as a co-founder and CTO at Area Hub. And uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about managing com computational chaos today with Hasra and State Machines. Um, we're going to be covering today Area Hub. Area Hub is uh, basically a startup we're working on that takes environmental hazards uh, around different areas in the United States and uh, compiles a report to inform individuals and users uh, about the environmental health. Um, and essentially, we'll talk about um, what we do uh, in a nutshell. And basically, you input an address. Um, and then what Area Hub does, it, it essentially looks for um, you know, uh, different categories uh, or different hazards, everything from air pollution, hurricanes, cell towers, uh, water quality for this um, example. And then we generate a nice uh, address report for everyone to uh, check out. Um, and if we wanted to like wrap up this in a process um, from a very high level, I think uh, this is how it'd go. We, we aggregate data sources. Um, we then run it through essentially a data pipeline where we prepare the data. Um, we then run um, some proprietary ML algorithms as well as um, some business logic and some magic dev sauce. Uh, which I'll refer to as intelligence uh, uh, from this point on, and then essentially generate a report. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking, like, where's the chaos in that? And uh, I think when we start diving deeper, uh, that's where we, we begin to see a little bit of chaos. Um, so if we dive in just to the data sources, we aggregate from multiple data sources. Um, and this data can be everything in the... Uh, uh, it can be available publicly. It's a mix of public, private, and then proprietary data sets. Um, and if we dive deeper into just the public or uh, the government data sets, um, we notice that we get different file formats. So everything from tabular data sets to uh, geospatial or just based data sets like GeoJSON, shapefiles and such, which is what we're usually looking for, all the way down to archaic forms like Excel and even plain text sometimes. Um, all, not only that, but we have to usually um, mitigate for missing or fragmented data pieces. We started noticing that there's a lot of missing data post 2017, whether that's political or not, we're not sure, but um, we have obviously had to create uh, a lot of mitigations for that. Um, this data is usually available, uh, uh, you know, rarely it's available uh, via APIs, but mainly it's there for, uh, we do like chronological downloads, um, on the data sets, usually they're large data sets. And we've even had cases where we had to uh, take handwritten uh, information um, from like, like before 1950s and digitize that um, in order to get a good uh, historical set on, um, on, on a specific category. Uh, so all in all, yeah, uh, we have uh, quite a large database now of uh, of uh, multiple categories and uh, uh, and essentially um, this kind of comprises uh, everything actually back to the 1800s we have um, uh, data on. But actually this only represents um, a flow for a single hazard and this would be air quality in this case. And so if we're looking at this picture, it actually looks more like this and if we're looking at this pipeline, it sort of looks more like this, where we have every category going through this pipeline, and then we have to apply the same um, computation in order to generate this report. But Billy May says, but wait, there's more. Uh, essentially, we have uh, overall categories, and we actually have um, these categories that um, sort of group um, different data, uh, different uh, subcategories. So we group things like air quality and water quality, um, cell towers and high voltage lines, um, and uh, different natural hazards like hurricanes, tornadoes, and such. Um, and we start to see a picture more like this, where we have our subcategories, then we're computing our overall categories, and then we're generating this report. And that's Area Hub in a nutshell. Um, so getting off the ground, you can like, if I had to, you know, talk about 
our architecture, I would say it comprises of three different aspects, the data pipeline, the access layer, and the presentation. Uh, we're mainly going to be talking about not really so much the data pipeline, I think that's a talk on its own, but um, more the networking between uh, what the results of the data pipeline and then, of course, uh, uh, the networking uh, from the access layer. So if you look at this, um, there's a lot of computation going on. And uh, you know we have multiple data sources for every subcategory. Then we're, we're trying to wrap it all into an overall category and then put it into a report. So if we try to pre-compute this for every single US address every single day, that would cost a lot of money. And as a small startup, that would certainly mean death for us. So. Um, we came up with a solution to dynamically sort of uh, uh, create this data on request where we would take a latitude and longitude of the area and then compute the results. But that provided proof to be very difficult. Um, we uh, first uh, tried using a custom Apollo server to run this and how that sort of worked um, was we would uh, go ahead and uh, query um, sort of uh, a report with lat long input. And that would go into our resolvers where we had all of our data sort of uh, sitting and that would go ahead and run a bunch of different uh, PostGIS functions uh, in order to cater the results. And so we saw response times of around 42 seconds. Uh, and of course that was ridiculous and horrible. So we needed to improve. Um, that being said, uh, the second iteration of our Apollo server, we decided to go ahead and um, move to AWS Lambda where we would sort of like wrap up all these processes in different lambdas and have the lambdas kind of communicate with one another. Um, and once we did that, the request started looking more like this, where we um, basically had our resolvers that were using the serverless framework and those serverless frameworks would basically go ahead and talk to each uh, serverless instance. Uh, so these would be our subcategories, these would be our overall categories. And what we also did was we actually composed a database for um, each and every one just for the computational layer. Um, and with all those improvements uh, and a lot of dev time, uh, we ended up getting the response down to around 18 seconds. Um, but that's where Hasra came in. And the really appealing thing about Hasra was uh, number one subscriptions out of the box, which, um, you know, having a dev team composed of basically one person, um, you know, implementing subscriptions was not really something that, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to spend time on. And so having that out of the box was really nice. Another thing was PostGIS. Hasra has wonderful support for PostGIS. Um, at Novum, we tend to prefer ORMs. Uh, for building any sort of like um, API or GraphQL layer. Um, and uh, what we noticed very quickly was post just support was either uh, limited or not there. And so when we saw Hasra, it, it, it was right out of the box and uh, that was very helpful. Um, computed fields. So if we're, if we're taking a bunch of nearby hazards and we're creating scores based off of the number of results we get, um, computed fields really help um, in that sense where we can actually um, you know, compute the results on the fly based off the query. Um, so that was another add. And of course, it was fast, it was blazing fast. Um, and so um, we introduced another component to this, which was AWS step functions. And the best way I can describe AWS functions, step functions in a nutshell is um, think of it as putting your business logic uh, or business workflow into a state machine, right? Where we are basically um, you know, categorizing these different workflows and we, you know, we can make decisions based off of the data, the incoming data, and they will go through these, uh, Lambda functions based off set data. Um, so this, this lamb, these lambdas that we wrapped, we actually, um, converted them into state machines or step functions. Uh, so basically we have our main report trigger or a report, um, workflow that connects to, um, our overall workflows and that connects to all these Lambda instances where we're able actually to reuse a lot of our AWS Lambda instances. Um, and if we had to kind of look at it from a workflow perspective, like this is, this is basically our report trigger where, um, you know, we check if the report exists. It's really hard to see. I'm sorry about that. AWS UI. <laughs> um, and we basically make a 
determination there whether or not if the report exists, then we go ahead and um, give it a success date and return the results. And then basically, uh, if it doesn't exist, we run basically, we trigger our other state machines that then uh, run parallel and um, are able to output our results. So Hostra with step functions, if we were to kind of put that into perspective, this is sort of how it works. We first th throw a mutation right on our search page and that in effect triggers an action. And also on the next client route, we actually um, go ahead and start listening to the subscription. And uh, that, ba that action basically sends uh, uh, a result to an API gateway that triggers our uh, state machine which triggers multiple categories. And how we have this uh, category sort of update uh, Hasra is through, through several mutations that occur within those state machines. And once those uh, results update, we're able to compose a report. So uh, basically like uh, in order to see, and it, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. So um, to kind of see this in real time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and input um, an address here. And then we go ahead and run the report and you can see what our response times look like. Um, and over here we have basically our overall categories that all are uh, resolved and we get our complete report. Uh, and then we can kind of look into each and every um, single hazard uh, where we can see nuclear plants that are nearby. Uh, so there's three near, nearby this uh, particular address. Um, we can see things like uh, radon. Hey Raj, uh, sorry for interrupting, ahead. but if you're, in case you're presenting another screen, we cannot see it. We can just see okay. slide with demo time. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so that, that makes sense, okay. So I'm gonna do this again. Um, so I'm going to run basically an address here on um, the site. And you can see our response times are very quick. Um, basically we get a report immediately through all of those computational processes. Uh, we can see different super funds or different hazards. Um, over here, we can see nuclear plants in this particular address. There's three. So we can kind of scroll through this. And we actually have metadata information on uh, said uh, nuclear um, uh, reactors. We also um, look for information like uh, radon, uh, air pollution, as well as uh, water quality. So we get water quality information on uh, violations and such. Um, and this is all happening uh, via our state machines. So if I were actually to take you into our, our, uh, uh, our step functions, um, basically we can see, uh, since I ran this report right now uh, on the uh, other screen. Hey, I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. Um, can you make sure that you're sharing this screen, um, the other screen that you're referring to right now? Oh, you guys can't see it still? No, we can only see your slides. Let me see. Can you guys see it now? Yes. Sweet. Okay. Do this one more time. All right. 304. <laughs> my turbine. So we're going to run a report again. And you can see that we have a really quick. Um, uh, response time here, where we're getting basically, again, our report uh, grade, and then we're getting our subcategory reports. Um, and if we go dive in deeper, again, we can see multiple hazards here. We can kind of scroll through it. We get sort of this map overview of different, like, uh, you know, everything from nuclear plants uh, to radon, where we can kind of, you know, view sort of like holistically what other counties in our area look like, uh, air pollution as well and even water quality where we're actually taking health violations and uh, uh, different water systems into account. Uh, if we were to go into our step functions result, um, you can basically see, I think I ran it like three times. So I'm gonna try to find, there we go. So you can basically see um, 
the workflow that it went through. Um, so it basically triggered the, the address actually didn't exist. So it goes ahead and um, runs this uh, each and every subcategory that triggers the other state machines. Uh, they run in parallel and give us a success, success state. Um, you can think of all these little blocks as lambdas. So if we were actually to, to click into here, we can actually go into that, that lambda view. Um, and so uh, basically that's, uh, that's kind of step functions in a nutshell. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share this again. And yeah, and that our average response times usually with Hasura and step functions went down from 42 seconds to 18 to now uh, around 500 uh, microseconds. Um, so a huge improvement. And uh, that's pretty much it. To, to all of you guys, happy holidays and uh, happy new year. And my name is Raj. Uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter um, at Raj in Wonderland. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Raj. That was a wonderful presentation. Plus, I really love your Twitter handle. So, <laughs> all right, um, folks, I will quickly share my screen with some really cool community updates that we have, um, starting with something that I'm super excited about, which is CraftQL Asia 2021. Um, this year, which is next year, <laughs> CraftQL Asia is our annual CraftQL conference, which is happening in February 2021. And the registrations and CFPs for talks and workshops are now open. So please make sure that if you're interested in giving a talk or workshop, um, you submit a CFP, which is called for papers. And this time you can submit it in any uh, Asian language. We're accepting um, CFPs for talks and workshops in any Asian language. So make sure you submit the CFPs. And if not, then you can always register because it's a free and online conference, um, which will happen in February. And yeah, you can just go to graphql.asia and um, uh, register yourself. A few more up upcoming events that I'm really excited about are the Hasura Actions Webinar. Um, the Actions Webinar is for everyone who wants to learn more about how Hasura Actions work, what they are, when and why you would want to use them um, and kind of um, compare them with remote schema, Hasura remote schemas. So this is also a webinar that you should definitely attend. That's happening on 22nd of December this year um, at 9 a.m. PT. And finally, we also have um, Hasura office hours that happen every Thursday at 11 a.m. PT. Um, Hasura office hours are um, these sessions where you can come hang out with the team. If you have any uh, questions, you can ask the team all about it and it's just a casual session where you can um, join and if you have any queries you can ask the team and get them answered so make sure that um, you join in the Hasura office hours they happen every Thursday at 11 a.m pt and finally we also have um, a monthly Hasura OSS digest where we talk about issues in a blog post that we want to um, that we are open to contributions for so this month we have a few server issues. Um, we will be sending out links um, to all of these resources, including this blog post to you on the email. So don't worry about the links. Um, check out the server CLI um, console and learn issues that we have open for you folks. If you're interested, uh, Hasra is always open to open source contributions. And if you need any help, then we are happy to help you in the Discord channel on, on the Contrib channel on Discord. Um, and finally, um, we are always working on improving our community calls because community is what makes Hasra um, the best version of itself. And we always want to make it um, uh, a great experience for you folks. So you can help us by um, giving us feedback through the uh, form, which is, as you can see, the link hasra.info slash com10. You can go to that link and um, drop your feedback um, and tell us about what you would like to see in the next call. Tell us about any feedback you have regarding the content of our previous or current community calls. 
And um, if you are interested in giving a demo, just like Raj um, and uh, Josh did this month, you can go to bit.ly slash community hyphen call hyphen demo and um, tell us about any interesting ideas you have around a community demo that you want to present at our upcoming calls. Um, and finally, our next community call is on January 28th, 9 a.m. PT. The agenda will be out soon, so make sure you join us for our next call next year. Thank you so much for joining us this month, folks. It was an amazing time with you all. And since this is end of the year community call, I would like to wish you all happy holidays. Um, 